Hello, this is Steve Googe, your instructor for Church Growth 301. I'm happy you've joined us again. I look forward to sharing with you today about doctrines of church growth. We have previously talked about the theology of church growth, and now some of the doctrines that are very important to a study of church growth. In this session, you will learn a definition of doctrine, the doctrine of inspiration of the Bible, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christ, and the doctrine of salvation. All of these are extremely valuable to you as you think about growing a church. I'm indebted to Dr. Alvin Reed and Multimedia Apologetics for some of the content of this presentation. Now let's talk about doctrines and church growth. You will notice that the slides in this presentation are very full. They're busy slides. Really, there's too much information on each slide, but I designed it that way because I want to give you the complete picture of church doctrine as it relates to church growth. Now, church growth relates to four central doctrines. First is the scripture, prolegomena. That means systematic theology. The doctrine of God, that's theology proper. The doctrine of Christ, we also know it as Christology. And the doctrine of salvation, that is soteriology. We will look at these categories in our slides. Before we look at specific doctrines of church growth, it might be helpful to define doctrine. What is a doctrine? Well, a doctrine is a belief or system of beliefs accepted as authoritative by some group or school. For the Christian church, it could be defined this way things that we affirm without question because they are so clearly stated in scriptures. And what about the word dogma? A doctrine or code of beliefs accepted as authoritative. Why was doctrine developed in the first place? Well, doctrine was developed because early Christians believed the entire Bible to be the Word of God. Since the entire Bible was the Word of God, they needed the truth of God, and therefore they developed their doctrine based upon the entire Word of God. A major motivating factor for developing doctrine was the countering of error. Their generation, as well as ours, was filled with false claims, with untruths, with heresy. And so they needed their doctrine to be able to know what they believed and why they believed it. Now let's briefly look at the doctrine of inspiration of the scriptures. When we say that the scriptures are inspired, what do we mean? We don't mean that God dictated the words as if those writers were robots in his hand. But he rather guided them and supervised the entire process. God superintended those human authors. There are over 40 authors of individual books in the Bible. We refer to the inspiration of the scripture as verbal plenary inspiration. God used the personalities of those writers and their personalities show in the works that they are responsible for. And they composed original writings without any error. Books were added to the Bible gradually. Here are some observations about that process. God inspired the books of the Bible, every one of them. God's people discovered these books, and they were inspired works, and they recognized that fact and added them to the canon of Scripture. How did they determine if a book should be included or not? Well, was the book written by an apostle? or a prophet of God? That was one of the questions that the church asked. Second, did the message tell the truth about God? Third, did the book have the power of God? When we read the Bible, we're not just simply reading a piece of literature. It has the power of God behind it. Was it accepted by the people of God? Those failing these criteria became the lost books 
of the Bible. Really, they weren't lost, but rather rejected by the early church. Here is a brief summary of the doctrine of inspiration. Jesus said that the Old Testament is imperishable. He believed in the Old Testament and its inspiration. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would guide the apostles into all truth. That resulted in the formation of the New Testament canon. God superintended the completion of the Bible. It wasn't by happenstance that the 66 books found their way into the canon of Scripture. Books recognized to be inspired were placed in the Bible. Now this is an important note. The Bible does not approve everything it records. Remember polygamy in the Old Testament? Or slavery? It reported those issues, but it did not give its approval to those kinds of things. We believe that the Bible is true in all that it affirms, and in every area. And now we examine the doctrine of God. Virtually all Christian doctrines are based on the doctrine of God. That is the foundation stone upon which all other doctrines need to be built. We need to know the true God in order to recognize false gods and idols. Our salvation depends upon knowing God through Christ Jesus. A proper understanding of God will aid in our spiritual growth. If we know what He desires, then we can provide that. His desire primarily is the obedience of His children. Now on the next slide, we will look at some of the attributes of God. I would never be able to give justice to the attributes of God. I can name some of them, but realize this is not an exhaustive list. Simplicity. God has no parts. Unity. There is only one God. Eternity. God is not in time and space. Immutability. God does not change. Omnipresence. God is everywhere. Sovereignty. God is the supreme ruler of all. Omniscience. God knows everything. Omnipotence. God is all-powerful. Justice. God treats individuals with moral equity. Truth. God is what is real and true. Love. God is unlimited in goodness. Freedom. God is independent of His creatures. And holiness. God is separate and pure. These are merely some of the attributes of our God, who is great beyond our ability to describe Him. The Doctrine of Christ. He existed with God in eternity before creation. He was born in the flesh. He was fully man and fully God. He led a sinless life. He voluntarily set aside certain divine attributes in His earthly ministry. He paid the penalty of sin with His death. He rose from the dead in a resurrection body. He ascended into heaven. He will return. The next three slides document the doctrine of salvation. God loves us. We find this in 1 John 4 verses 9 and 10. By this the love of God was manifest in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Jesus paid the price for our sins. Matthew twenty twenty eight says, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give His life a ransom for many. We are reconciled to God through Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 18-19 say this, Now everything is from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, 
God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. This is the biblical basis of the doctrine of salvation. Some in our culture accuse Christians of being exclusive, narrow-minded, and believing they're the only ones that possess the truth. Well, in terms of the doctrine of salvation, it is very focused. For Jesus is the only way. John 14.6 records the words of Jesus. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 3.16-18 through 18. For God loved the world in this way. He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world that He might judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Anyone who believes in Him is not judged, but anyone who does not believe is already judged, because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. The scripture is very clear. There is only one way to salvation, and that way, that truth, that life, is Jesus Christ. This is the concluding slide that deals with the doctrine of salvation and this presentation. Salvation in all ages comes through faith. Galatians 3, 6-9 even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. So then... Those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. We should not expect to spend eternity with God if we never believed in. 